Hi, my name is Alex Dolphin. Welcome back to another episode of Ex Ante. Today we're going to discuss the case of Gann vs. Rich. This case was heard in the Massachusetts Federal District Court in the year of 1881. Let's go ahead and jump into the facts of the case. So to understand this case, we need to understand what whale hunting looked like in the late 19th century in Massachusetts. Whale hunting often took place with whalers in boats shooting at whales with what was called a bomb lance, it was a harpoon of a type, at a whale from the boat. When the whale was hit successfully by the hunter, the whale would then sink to the bottom of the ocean. After one to three days, the whale would rise up to the top of the ocean, the surface. And once it was there, it would perhaps float out to sea, or oftentimes it would float into shore. Um, the whales that floated into shore were identified, and it was commonplace, would be identified by what some folks called finders. When finders found these whales, they would then contact the whale hunters and say, hey, I think we found your whale. Um, the whale hunters would uh, then reward the finders with a, a portion of the money that they received from selling the whale, and the parties were happy. So that was the custom of hunting for whales in, in Massachusetts in the late 19th century. This case uh, was raised because someone disobeyed the custom. So uh, Gen is the named plaintiff in, in this case, and Gen was a whale hunter who had killed a whale um, that then rose to the surface and floated to shore. Um, a gentleman found this whale on shore, his name was Ellis. And when he found this whale, he, uh, he disobeyed the custom and sold this whale himself on the free market at auction. Um, he sold this whale to a gentleman by last name of Rich. Uh, Rich is the named defendant in this case because he was the one holding the whale at the time. Um, <clears throat> the court was tasked with the question of who owns the whale? Is it the person who actually killed the whale? or is the person who finds the whale after it has risen to the surface and floated into shore? Um, to answer that question, the court found in favor of the individual who actually killed the whale, said that the person who killed the whale um, did all that they could to capture that property. All that they could was done to capture that property, and the finder doesn't have any of the property rights to that whale. The whale is fully owned by the killer of it. So that was the ruling of the court. As far as justification, the, the court, uh, Judge Nelson, found that it was important for him in his decision to incentivize whale hunting. It was an important facet of the economy. And he felt that if he ruled in favor of the finders, rather than in the actual killer, which is again in this case of the whale, that it would de-incentivize whaling as a whole. Um, people wouldn't be interested in hunting for whales because they knew that when they floated to shore and were found by someone on shore, they would have no property rights to them. So this would have incentivized vast amounts of finders, you know, looking for whales, and the folks who actually killed the whales wouldn't have had much of an opportunity um, to get any type of a, a financial gain from killing that whale. So that was the ruling rule in favor of Gen uh, and held that the property rights um, were acquired by him when he killed the whale and, and that the, the person Ellis, um, who later sold to Rich, found the whale on shore, he really didn't have any property rights um, to the whale. So that's uh, the ruling along with our issue and, and, and kind of just the general case brief. Now let's go ahead and jump into some ex ante implications of the case. Um, and you know, the judge, Judge Nelson, did err on the side of the hunters of the whale, uh, but he didn't put any type of a property right in for the finders of the whale. I think it might've been more interesting for him to say, you know, hunters of the whale, when they kill the whale, they get, you know, 90% of the property rights and the individual who finds the whale gets 10%. And then it's important for those two to distribute those property rights economically between one another. Um, that's because his ruling doesn't incentivize any type of finding of whales. And it's important for people to be finding whales for this economy to function. And metaphorically, whale finders, um, in this case, are, are very important to other facets of society. So uh, one thing that I wrote was it, incent it incentivizes one to maximize firm possession, firm possession being the killing of the whale, but it does not incentivize the maxima maximization of the economic utility of that property. Um, this incentivizes people like Gen to rather than just kill one whale, secure it, uh, bring it back to shore, or kill one whale, survey it, find it on shore. It encourages people like Gen to kill 50 whales in hopes that two turn up on shore. Um, in a situation where there's scarce resources, a tragedy of the commons is what it is sometimes called, um, 
we don't want to incentivize people to take more than is necessary for the economic gain. We want to maximize the economic gain for each individual um, and, and eliminate as much waste as possible. This ruling by disincentivizing finding um, and putting more and more of the emphasis upon killing of whales, uh, in fact, does the opposite. It uh, incentivizes more whalers to just kill whales senselessly in hopes that a few turn up on shore um, and it doesn't incentivize the finders to do that active work of finding all the whales because they don't have any reward by the law. The custom might be that they get rewarded, but by the law, they have no reward. Uh, so thanks so much for watching this episode, and I hope you have a nice rest of your day. Bye.